That's it. Okay, just leave it there. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Well, sorry for that rather disjointed beginning. But look, I'm uh, Sonia Pivak, and uh, I am here today to talk about the. Um, well, not, it's, it's not a niche, niche version of Minecraft that's uh, creating a virtual land for the deaf community. It's, uh, it's basically Sign DNA, which is the Sign Language Deaf National Archive. It's a project we've been working on at Deaf Radio for the last 18 months. So I'm going to give you just a quick tour through some of the uh, achievements, frustrations, barriers, and dreams we've had over that period of time. So as I say, Sign Language uh, Deaf National Archive, Sign DNA, we thought was the perfect name because Sign language is in the blood of deaf people, um, so we felt like it was a good use of an uh, acronym. Before I go any further, let me just explain what Deaf Radio is and who we are. So Deaf Radio is a sign language hub, basically, and we take on projects or services, anything that relates to sign language or deaf people. So we dream in sign language and think about sign language pretty much all the time. Um, and this is one of our services that we've developed about 18 months ago called Seaflow, which was an online translation service which enabled deaf people to access government information in particular in, in sign language, but also personal uh, correspondence as well. We've been involved in developing the sign language curriculum for schools, year seven and eight. And uh, on the side of some commercial projects, we've been doing Sign DNA as a non-profit project with another charity group. So I'll explain a little bit more about that one. Before I do, let me give you some other context. I'm a deaf person, you've probably realized that already. I was born into a deaf family, so my sister is deaf, my parents are deaf, my extended family has many deaf people in it as well. So I, I grew up already with quite a strong deaf cultural identity. Because deaf people do have their own culture, language, uh, values, ways of seeing the world, stories, history. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have that in abundance when I was growing up, but that's not the norm for deaf people typically. Um, and globally, only 5% of deaf people have another deaf person in their family. So 95% of deaf people are the only deaf person in their family. And so they don't necessarily have access to the culture or the values of deaf people as they're growing up. They may be schooled in a different way or be raised as a hearing person with um, other technology, hearing aids, speech therapy, things like that. So they often come back into the deaf community, sometimes when they're teenagers or early adults. And so it's important that the community has structures and mechanisms to help those people acculturate back into uh, the deaf community. Deaf community uh, is a culture with no land, obviously. No, there's no deaf island or deaf continent, uh, although deaf people are everywhere. But there are some deaf properties, and they are very highly valued in the deaf community. So here's some images of deaf clubs throughout New Zealand. Um, strangely, New Zealand's deaf clubs are still quite strong. Overseas, we're looking at other countries mainly closing down a lot of the deaf clubs as youth prefer not to go to places where older people drink and tell stories. They tend to want to congregate in other places. So there was some research in Australia recently that compared uh, a group of elderly deaf people and a group of deaf youths and gave them a map of Sydney a physical map and asked each group to put a pin on physical locations that they felt any attachment to. And a lot of older deaf people thought, well, it'll be there and there, it'll be where the deaf school was, where the deaf club is, where we had that sports tournament 20 years ago. Um, so they you know, covered the map in pins, but the, the youth group didn't have any physical attachments to anywhere in Sydney. Uh, it's certainly not in the same magnitude as the elderly community, so their sense of value in place seems to have changed quite dramatically. One of our taonga is sign language, of course. It's a unique native language to New Zealand, and it's quite different to English. It's a 3D moving language that requires gesture and movement, so it doesn't have a written form. So the only way of recording or presenting sign language is on videotape. Obviously, it's perfectly suited to that. So our aim is to collect a lot of the video material that has been shot over the decades that includes deaf people or sign language so that we can position them in one place for easy access, whether that's for education or personal interest or research or acculturation of deaf people. 
As I said before, most deaf people have hearing families, so many of the tapes that they may have taken of uh, the deaf community at that time are being lost because hearing families are not aware of the cultural significance of those tapes, and when that person passes away, often those tapes are destroyed. There are also um, materials in institutions, and we're trying to access those as well. So the Deaf Radio team sort of decided on building an archive as a good concept, but we wanted to check with the elders of the community first to see if they were interested to support it, whether they thought it was a good idea, and they were fully behind it. This is Owen Gibbons, who's a well-known deaf man in the deaf community, has been there for, for decades, um, has a passion for dancing on tables, but uh, <laughs> don't ask me why, but that's just what he likes to do. But he was also one of the, um, he was the first person to give us his box of uh, old eight millimeter films that he'd taken and here they are. So that was, that was huge for us, because at that time we were still just asking around to see if it was a good idea or not. Um, and here was this box of films from the 50s and 60s. We know that Owen was central to the deaf community in Auckland for many years. We knew how valuable they would be. So we quickly said to him, yep, that's fine, fantastic. We can't wait to get these digitized, and we'll give you a copy. Um, and you can see some of these films, including uh, the wedding to his late wife. Unfortunately, we sent them to various commercial operations to get digitized, and none of them could do it because the state of the film was in such deterioration, they weren't able to do it. Um, and that became very disappointing because we would send them you know, to different places around New Zealand and Australia, and the answer was always the same, that they couldn't be retrieved. Um, we even contacted uh, Weta in Wellington to beg for their assistance, um, and, but they couldn't help in this particular instance. So we were fortunate enough at this time to be uh, in contact with the New Zealand Film Archive in Wellington and presented this problem to them and we flew down with the box and met with them, um, with the coffee obviously as well. And uh, they could see the state that they were in, they couldn't make any promises, uh, but over the next few months they had spent uh, a lot of uh, free time and effort in digitizing what they could. Apparently a lot of the films were sort of dissolving as they went through the machine. And even some of the older films, they were just taking still shots of whenever they could. So that was a, a huge uh, boost in the arm for us in terms of our motivation. So beginning this group, obviously we needed to apply for funding. We're a company, so that becomes very difficult. We decided to set up this group under an umbrella organization called Diversity Works Trust, uh, who can apply for funding on our behalf and, and help us oversee the project. But we wanted to make sure that the archive itself was owned by the deaf community, uh, not by us or not by another trust. So we asked the communities around New Zealand to nominate people that they thought would be good custodians of this archive. And these are the people that were selected. So the concept started to get some momentum. We had uh, a group set up under the trust. We had an advisory group. And so we needed to now let people know that they could start to contribute their films to this archive. So it was a, a barrage of cards and contact and emails and meetings and presentations and Twitter and social media. And it worked. We started to receive a lot of material from the deaf community. So far we've received almost 600 separate films and videos. Uh, some are on DVDs, some have already been digitized. Uh, we're only accepting, accepting material up to 1990 because we think that's the most critical period. Uh, there's the higher risk of the substrates deteriorating. The oldest we've received so far is 1951. The woman on the left there is Annette Scott. She's the president of the Manawatu Deaf Society. She was thrilled because she'd been the custodian of this box of local films and videos as had the previous presidents before her waiting for this kind of project to come along and not knowing what to do with it in the meantime. So we obviously acknowledge where these recordings come from and we give back a digital recording to the people that have contributed the films. And obviously they get the original back as well if they want to. So we now had all these films and no money to do anything with it. So that was good in one sense, but a bit frustrating in another. We still need, needed some funds to move ahead with the project. So we thought about uh, sausage sizzle at Mitre 10, but we realized that would take decades. <laughs> so we decided to uh, 
go with Pledge Me, which was just sort of starting up at that time, and we decided to make the amount that we required $10,000, which was generally pretty silly, people thought. Um, and I think some of you have probably received a number of emails and, and requests for donations, and many of you did donate to this project, we know. And over that two-month period, on the last day, we finally got over that 10,000 barriers, 10,415 by the time it closed, which was fantastic for us because um, even Pledge Me themselves said, look, you know, requests of that amount, only 5% are successful. So we were really uh, sort of humbled by that level of support from the community. It's still a lot of work to, um, to sort of prompt people and organize that. It's probably a couple of hundred hours work, um, but it was still well worth it. So I've mentioned a few successes so far, but it hasn't been plain sailing. Um, as I said to you before, some videos are owned by private individuals and they have been willing to contribute them, but still some are held by institutions. Um, and that's been more difficult to negotiate. The, the deaf schools in New Zealand have hundreds of uh, videos of events that they've recorded over the years, but um, are still reluctant to to allow you know an outside group to uh, to work with them. So it's still a work in progress. We've also had some issues with TVNZ, who have filmed a lot of deaf events and deaf people um, in the past few decades, and we've asked them to donate their material as well because we are a non-profit project, and this is a native language, and TVNZ are supposedly working with the government. So we've <laughs> done our best to try and convince them of the merits of this project and that, that they should donate these free. But it, the original quotes were extremely expensive. Um, but fortunately, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage has been working with them uh, on this topic and others, and they've reduced the licensing fees. So there's still some cost in terms of getting access to them, but the cost is, is, is greatly reduced, which is fantastic. I think when we started the project, um, we had no idea on how much work was involved or how big the archive would be. We haven't been involved in this kind of thing before. And as we began to add more features to what we wanted in terms of the archive, uh, the costs generally uh, ballooned. So fortunately, what we lacked in financial power, we had in people power. So people from the deaf community were coming in and volunteering their time to help with processing the videos in terms of what the video content was, uh, adding sort of time markers to, so we knew where certain segments began and ended and what those different topics were. So this is a typical um, sheet that we would use to process one of the videos. So again, all these have been uh, filled in by volunteers now for hundreds of videos. Um, but you know, to do this amount of work on 600 videos uh, is turning me gray already. So that's the same thing, just from a larger perspective. We've also been trying to engage with the community as much as we can, because sometimes we see videos or contents of videos and we don't know who they are or what the events are. So we've put requests out through social media uh, to try and get some assistance from the community in terms of identifying people and events. $20,000, that's what we thought it would cost when we started the project. Uh, that's what, because we knew it would be an online archive, it would be free to access, uh, it would be accessible by youth and uh, older members of the community, so we thought, yeah, we sort of budgeted it out, we thought 20 sounded quite realistic. I'm not sure if it sounds realistic to you, you might be laughing already. But obviously, the, as things grew and we added more sort of deaf specific features to the archive, those costs really did uh, start to more than triple. So. To be honest, we were hoping to be able to show you uh, it's almost like a preview of the completed site by now when we put in this paper request months ago. But for various different reasons, and financial reasons are one of the significant ones, uh, the, the finishing of the archive has been put off till about March of next year. And I'm not going to go through, um, you know, looking at the archive and what it does. And I mean, you can you can do that when it's released and you know a lot about what archives are already. So I might just pick out, before I finish, one or two aspects of the archive that are quite unique to the deaf people. We're also thinking that this will create some kind of platform for younger deaf people to work with older deaf people, to create that kind of, to sort of bridge that divide 
uh, through creating this virtual land. So we've set up a few features that we think might help with this. This is not actually what the final website looks like. This is just a draft for just to show you, to give you an idea. But let's say the video in this instance was the sign singers on the top left-hand corner. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, Catherine may have heard of this event or have, you know, deaf people are great storytellers, so they will have heard about stories including these sign singers. So this allows people to uh, present or comment back to the archive or add their stories or add their memories, as uh, Helen was saying, into the sign DNA archive. And hopefully that'll take on a life of its own. So that the original item just becomes a stimulus for drawing experiences and memories out of the community. People can also type their comments in English if they want to. Uh, it's a bilingual website. But in this case, they can also film their responses directly in NZSL, directly into the website. They don't have to record it on a separate program and then upload it. They can just... Um, record it straight into the website. It's all um, done through uh, Node.js, so it's reasonably robust. We'll also have a feature to, again, try and elicit more participation and ownership from the deaf community. So this is a feature where deaf people are able to name who is present in certain videos. Um, you might also be familiar with this kind of concept in Facebook where you can tag videos, uh, sorry, tag photographs. Uh, we're developing a feature where you can tag videos so that deaf people can register as a friend of the archive and go in and contribute their knowledge, contribute their stories or their videos even to the archive. So there's a few little features like that that we're developing to help the community uh, use it and take more ownership of this historical archive. And just finally, uh, a word about sustainability. Obviously, we don't want to set up a project to last a year and then have to close down because we don't have any funds. Uh, money does talk, obviously. So at the moment, we're focusing on videos up until the 1990s. Uh, but obviously, there's a lot more that could be included in the archive. But as I say, money is one of the biggest issues. We've got now over 600 videos. We're expected to go over 1,000 before too long. These videos are accessible via websites and smart devices, so they have to be uploaded uh, in WebM and MP4. So there's a huge amount of memory that needs to be stored. Uh, the cost of that is quite prohibitive because it's video, of course, rather than um, you know text documents or images. So we've been informed that's about six. What we have at the moment is about six hundred dollars worth of memory per month to host. Um, so that's, that's quite a lot for a small archive to have to cope with just in terms of hosting and storage. So we're trying to think of other ways to, to go forward. Um, we have set up an official trust now of our own rather than working underneath another trust. So we will be applying for funds to cover the ongoing costs. We're also thinking of licensing signed DNA so that deaf communities in other countries can use the same template to do the same kind of archiving of their video histories and their, and their sign language histories. Uh, it also means that any improvements we make can then be uh, you know, leveraged to other countries. So some of that will help cover those ongoing costs, because um, we do want to try and make it sustainable, obviously. And that's my talk. Some of you may recognize this font, by the way. Um, might have triggered some uh, some connections for you or recollections. Uh, it is a font based on the paintings of Colin McCann, which obviously is a New Zealand painter. And we thought that was great for our archive because it is a New Zealand archive. It's kind of, um, you know, it's homemade contributions. We didn't want anything to look too technical. So we begged the designer of the font to allow us to use it. So we've just got permission to do that. But um, we also want to ask for your help. If you have any ideas on uh, on how we can make this possible or programs you know of or people that we can contact we'd much we'd, we'd love to hear from you so please do come forward thank you very much